Hi, everyone. My name is Ware Harmon, and I'm the Executive Director of Town Hall Seattle. On behalf of Town Hall and our friends at Third Place Books, it's a pleasure to welcome you to tonight's live stream presentation featuring Alyssa Washuta and Teresa Warburton in conversation with Kristen Meares as part of our Arts and Culture series. As we get underway, I want to acknowledge that our institution stands on the unceded traditional territory of the Coast Salish people, particularly the Duwamish. We thank them for our continued use of the natural resources of their ancestral homeland. And we thank you all for joining us here on our new streaming platform, My Town Hall Seattle. Like everything at Town Hall, it's decidedly a work in progress. So if you have any questions or concerns, use the patron services email that you'll find in the chat. Tonight's conversation will run around 60 minutes, including a Q&A. Questions will be selected from those in the chat field at the bottom of the video, uh, below the video player. You might have to scroll down to see it. Feel free to add yours at any time. Know that we can't guarantee we'll be able to address everyone, but we'll try to get to as many as possible. So keep them concise and question-like to facilitate that. For those who would like to view the program with closed captions, click the CC button in the bottom right-hand corner of the video player. Town Hall adds new stuff all the time. Upcoming programs include the next installment of Civic Cocktail produced by City Club, which will discuss the efforts to revive downtown, downtown Seattle. Uh, it'll feature Bob Donegan, president of Ivers, and Brian Surratt, former director of the City of Seattle's Office of Economic Development. Also foreign policy expert John Pfeffer will consider whether a better world is really possible in the wake of COVID-19. The next concert in our Global Rhythm series this Friday will feature the exquisite Cape Verdean singer and guitarist Cheka. You can check out more of what's upcoming by visiting our online calendar at townhallseattle.org. Town Hall's work is made possible through your support and the support of our sponsors. Our Arts and Culture series is supported by Four Culture, Arts Fund, Seattle's Office of Arts and Culture, uh, the Norcliffe Foundation and the Wincote Foundation Northwest. But as most of you know, Town Hall is at heart a member supported organization and we wanna thank all of our members watching tonight. One last note, you will most certainly want to learn more about the books being discussed tonight. And that means you'll wanna purchase them. And we hope you'll do so using the, the link in the chat um, that's, uh, and you can purchase tonight through the publisher rather than later from you know an anonymous vendor of, of groceries and whatever else <laughs> that's going there these days. All right then. Alyssa Washuda is a member of the Cowlitz Indian tribe, a nonfiction writer and a professor of creative writing. She's the author of My Body is a Book of Rules and Starvation Mode, both from 2014. With Teresa Warburton, she is co-editor of the 2019 anthology Shapes of Native Nonfiction, Collected Essays by Contemporary Writers. She's received fellowships and awards from the National Endowment for the Arts, Creative Capital, uh, Artist Trust, For, Cap For Culture, and the Potlatch Fund. Dr. Teresa Warburton lives in Lummi, Nooksack, and Coast Salish territories in Bellingham, Washington. She is an associate professor of English at Western Washington University, where she is also affiliate faculty in women's, gender, and sexuality studies and Canadian American studies. Dr. Warburton is, Warburton is an interdisciplinary literary scholar whose work focuses on the intersections of literature and radical social movements, and her current book project, entitled The Politics of Make-Believe, Answering Native Women's Writing in Contemporary Anarchist Movements, um, explores how the political, aesthetic, and rhetorical interventions of contemporary Native women's literature speak to some of the limitations of current anti-authoritarian movements in North America. Kristen Meares Young, I should have said that before, sorry, Kristen Meares Young's novel, Subduction, was published just last year. The editor of Seismic, Seattle City of Literature, Miara's Young served as the 2018 through 20 prose writer in residence at Hugo House, anthologized in Alone Together, Latina Outsiders, and Advanced Creative Nonfiction. Her essays have appeared in the Washington Post, Literary Hub, and The Guardian. Miara's Young was the researcher for the New York Times team that produced Snowfall, The Avalanche at Tunnel Creek, an article and ebook which won a Pulitzer in 2013. Tonight is special for us as Washuta and Warburton both have books which we'll be discussing. Washuta's book, a collection of essays, is titled White Magic. Warburton's is called Other Worlds Here, Honoring Native Women's Writing in Contemporary Anarchist Movements. Please join me in welcoming Kristen Miyares in conversation with Alicia was Kristen Miyares Young in conversation with Alyssa Washuta and Teresa Warburton. Thank you, Ware. Uh, very kind. I am very grateful to be here with Town Hall Seattle and supported by Third Place Books uh, to discuss white magic and other worlds here. There is so much that unifies these books, not the least of which is a deep, deep concern for our ethical commitments to each other. And as part of that, I wanted to go ahead and ask Alyssa something that appeared in White Magic as 
just a line, uh, but was also an ethos that really spoke to me as someone who has lived in Seattle uh, for almost two decades now. Alyssa, you describe Seattle in contemporary times as a mirage. Why? I'd be so curious to hear um, what what it, how it speaks to you because I know that this is um, spoken to a few um, other people I've I've spoken to um, from Seattle or living in Seattle. So I lived in Seattle from 2007 to 2017 um, before coming out here to Ohio to teach at the Ohio State University. Um, I I came to Seattle at age 22. Um, I was familiar with Seattle um, because I have family in Seattle, near Seattle, and, you know, all my life um, had been going out for, for visits and just loved the city. It was, you know, for so much of my life, especially like beginning in high school when I was really into Nirvana and Pearl Jam uh, and, you know, all the rest, it was it was a real place to me, but it was also so much an idea. It was a, like a fantasy where I was going to have my adulthood. Um, I ended up, you know, I was in New Jersey then. I ended up um, going to college in Maryland and then eventually did go out to, wa to Seattle for grad school at the University of Washington. And, you know, all of that time before I got out to Seattle, it was just built up so much in my imagination and at the same time was real. When I got out there, those two converged into, you know, something that never, I, you know, in 10 years, I didn't shake that sense that the place was not quite real to me. You know, I think in part, it, it, it is because of the mountains. They are so distant and so present. It's, you know, I know they don't like look like that, up close. There is some kind of distortion happening in the sky. I don't know. That's beyond me. But, um, you know, there's just something that seems so fantastical about a place beautiful in that particular way. That is beautiful, like, you know, having to do with, um, you know, like where my family has been for 10,000 years, not, not in Seattle proper or even near Seattle, but in the Pacific Northwest. Uh, landscape so different from where I had grown up. Anyway, I, you know, I think the whole time I was there, I felt that I was working toward my real life that I knew had not arrived yet. You know, I was working a half-time job. Um, the whole time I was there after, after my first couple years of grad school, um, you know, I was doing so many things to try to just make ends meet, you know, not even living paycheck to paycheck a lot of the time, um, you know, going into debt. And I just kept feeling like I know in my, you know, my, like my brain is telling me I will never have a house. I'll never actually be able to make it work here. It's not possible. It is not financially possible for me to make a life here. But I just felt like the, the dream was... It, it dominated my life until that's all there was. And so that's why I kind of think of it as a mirage, this like place of um, extreme like hope for this better future um, that was just so far from reality. I love Seattle. There is so much about it that's like, re like real and, and, you know, of course my friendships I made there. But I think that, that's what I was trying to talk about in White Magic um, which is so focused on my obsession with permanence and my anxiety about, um, you know, the, the, the extreme realness of real life. Well, for those of us who came here to take on jobs, I came here to take a job at the Seattle Post Intelligencer. The idea of permanence in Seattle is certainly being foreclosed by the massive tides of wealth that are overtaking every single neighborhood, the suburbs, the exurbs, and all the other cities. Mm -hmm. So it definitely feels um, shimmering in the distance, the possibility <laughs> of permanence here. And yet we keep on coming here, right? Because there are, there are cultural centers. And yeah. uh, Teresa, you know, you are someone who has done a deep study of the history of anarchist movements here in the Pacific Northwest, as well as uh, indigenous uh, movements and uh, ideologies and beliefs. 
And I know that you and Alyssa have collaborated in the past on that Shapes of uh, Native Nonfiction. So how did you come to meet? And then why did you decide to work together? Wow, this is a, I guess a funny story. We sort of always say, or I always say that Amazon set us up um, <laughs> because uh, what happened was I, I moved from Buffalo, New York to Bellingham, Washington to take a job. Um, and Amazon like sent, you know, sends me emails. that's like, you might like this book. You might like, and I always like turn it off and I'm like, don't tell me what I like, but it recommended Alyssa's book and the cover. If you've seen the cover of my body, it's a book of rules is amazing. Um, and I was like, well, I have to read this book. And then when I got it and saw that she was at the university of Washington, I said, well, I want to bring her up to, I'm at Western Washington university. Um, and two, I think like two things happened that made us like really be like, this is a, a longer term relationship than just bringing somebody up for a visit um, is one, well, I was on campus when Alyssa arrived. And so my partner walked her to campus and it was like when I opened my office door, um, Alyssa was turned around. So I saw her back and it was like my back. And then we, she turned around and we like apprehended each other. And it was, we looked, we were dressed like identically. Um, and I think we even had the same shoes. And so that happened and we were both sort of like, whoa, this is a weird cosmic thing that's happening. And then the other thing that happened is Alyssa was, stayed with me because I said, you know, we could get you a hotel or we could just give you that money. And Alyssa said, just give me that money. Um, and so she's left in this room that I'm in right now. And we talked, um, I remember that night we talked a lot about Yik Yak, which was a social media <laughs> platform at the time that <laughs> based on your proximity so it was based on like who was near you that you could see um things that people it was terrible it was a terrible app and there was the big controversy happening at western because of it and so i told Alyssa about it and we spent the whole night um <laughs> <laughs> on yik yak and i think that that you know led to us working together because we just had this really easy sort of discussion about or like discussions about our sort of work together and our work separately that felt like we were both interested in similar things and then that we got something out of being around another person who we felt like some cosmic connection to I think was really important for me at least um, and it actually set us up really well to work well together um, on the book because I was living in Providence when we were working on the book and Alyssa was living in Columbus and then now I'm in Washington and Alyssa's still in Columbus so a lot of that like internet communication and learning how to like have a really good friendship over text came in handy. We I mean that is literally the very first time that Amazon has been referenced to me as having performed an intellectual Tinder function. Yeah, I didn't, buy, <laughs> I didn't buy the book from Amazon. I just want to be clear. I bought it from somewhere else, but Amazon did set us up. And I don't know what it was about that email that I was like, that, I don't know, that just is a really great title. Um, yeah, we sometimes say that we wrote Shapes of Native Nonfiction over text message because we I would mean, send we each did. other. Yeah, we did. We did though. <laughs> An exquisite vessel via text message. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, Teresa, you know, Other Worlds here uh, does show so much interest in Washuda's work. And so I uh, won't, um, I won't belabor the praise uh, that you offer, which is real and sustained. But there's a question inside of it that I think that really speaks to both your and Alyssa's work. And it's foundational to Other Worlds here, which was that how can we better answer uh, the responsibilities to place into each other that are mapped in Native women's literature. So it's a central yeah. question of other worlds here, and it, you explore that through anarchist movements and through Native women's literature. So thank you for uh, sharing your answer with us now. Yeah, I think that one of the, I mean, there's always like the sort of basic ways, I think, like knowing where you are and how you got there and knowing whose land it is and who belongs to the land and what sort of just what histories came before you, I think is really important. But the when I was writing, I think, the way that I really wanted to answer that question was through story. And that I think being more attuned to storytelling as a, as a political practice is something that I was really interested in, like bringing into, into the conversation. Um, I've been part of a number of different sort of radical reading groups in my life. Um, and they were so formative for my development as a political person like or is somebody who could like form political beliefs like all of those 
spaces were were really essential to that, but so few of those spaces really centered literature or centered like fiction or poetry or creative nonfiction. And I was really interested in that. And just, I think that paying better attention to stories helps to, to create like a different value system that really emphasizes um, like the sort of cosmological and methodological aspects of stories so that stories are giving us things when we read them and we have a responsibility to do things with the things we learn from those stories. And so, and that stories are so connected to place themselves that, um, and I even, you know, I think that's true for a lot of different stories in the book. I talk about the story of the battle in Seattle and how that's tied to place. And so I just think that that aspect of storytelling was really essential for me for thinking about how to have a better relationship to place by having a different value system come in. And that's what brought drew me to Alyssa's work. Well, I have to say that I also, uh, because of my body is a book of rules, uh, followed Alyssa to Red Hand Press who put out that book and um, am so grateful to Tin House for bringing in white magic and thinking about um, white magic. One of the, my favorite essays in the book, Alyssa, was White City. And I was wondering how did place come to form the central narrative of that and other essays in white magic? Yeah, I think, you know, it's, uh, it's a, it's a lot, it's such a long story. I don't know how to tell it in a way that's not long, but I, I figure you two would be okay with that. Um, my roundabout way. So, you know, when I was writing fiction as an undergrad, um, a common critique that I got was that, you know, sense of place was just not there. It was like, where was this? This could be anywhere like we don't know anything about any detail related to place um, and like people were just floating. And I think, you know, I, I was, I had never lived outside the mid-Atlantic. Um, you know, I was born and raised in New Jersey, was living in Maryland. They're similar in some ways, although nowhere is like Jersey, but um, you know, I, I didn't, I, I didn't really form a strong relationship with place that was visible to me, like the relationship itself being visible to me until I got to Seattle. And then all of it became clear. Like I understood my relationship with Seattle. I, I mean, eventually, but not, it didn't take me that long because I was thinking about it a lot, you know, um, just how happy I was to finally be there. Um, and I understood my relationship with Jersey a few years after, you know, after moving to Seattle and Maryland and all of that. Um, and I think that, you know, my body is a book of rules. I wrote mostly during those first two years in Seattle in grad school and then somewhat after it when I was still forming that relationship. White Magic, I worked on, you know, for eight years. And I, I mean, I struggled with lots of it. There's, you know, there were lots of <laughs> digressions into, you know, trying to plot novels and I don't know, trying to write a book on the paleo diet because <laughs> I used to go to level four <laughs> CrossFit and they, they had me try paleo. Um, and, you know, eventually I started writing about Seattle more. And as I was really understanding what it meant to me to live there. And so White City is one of the earlier essays that I, um, that I wrote in full. And I was doing research on that for so long. I was really stalling, I think, but you know, I spent years just compiling so many articles on the Madison Park neighborhood. Um, you know, I have like probably the largest electronic archive of articles about the like neighborhood happenings of, of Madison Park. Um, and Finally, when I was doing the Fremont Bridge residency, um, I started writing it and I, I wrote that. I finally like, you know, decided I could stop researching and start writing that essay. Um, I was just so fascinated at that time with, you know, Madison Park as the neighborhood I lived in. The, the, the feeling of Seattle as a mirage I was talking about earlier, definitely the peak came when I lived in Madison Park and, 
you know, I felt like I was in like permanent vacation. Everyone's yards are so cool. Like, you know, like garden yards. And I just loved walking around the neighborhood. I loved going down to the water. Um, and it really seemed imaginary. And I wanted to learn its story and tell its story because I just loved be like walking around it. Um, and I was also fascinated by, you know, the relationship with the, like the spirit world that I was developing there and um, the history of um, colonization and disruptions to the natural world, um, you know, the, the landscape, the flora um, of, that, of that area that became that neighborhood um, and the spirits like Ayahus, which I, I write about in that essay, the serpent spirit um, that that lived around that area in the lake above the lake, um, and so I think that that you know it was the it was when the project really came into focus so much. Even though I don't think of the book as being primarily about land or place, in a way it is because I just was, you know, as much as it's about heartbreak because of this failed relationship that I had, um, which is, you know, central to the book. I think more than that, it's, it's really about the, like the pain I still felt while, you know, through the end of the writing process was the pain of, of losing the place. You know, I mean, I love it here in Ohio, but it's always going to pa be painful to me, I think, to be, to be away from Seattle. Um, and the writing process was ultimately about like, how do I, um, how do I maintain that relationship even when I can't be there? It's like through, through my imagination and through um, just in, engaging with memory. Well, as David Nyman mentioned in his uh, Between the Covers podcast that you did recently, the terraforming that you describe uh, of the shorelines being moved, things being flooded, dredged, sluiced, um, the grief of that haunting of what the original topography was certainly does come out through that essay, which I think is a real contribution to arts and letters. Um, but we have a question from the audience that I wanted to uh, direct to you, Alyssa. Can you talk about the criticism of the colonist about impermanence, that colonists move around a lot, maybe what that means for a white sense of place in America? So the way that I... Um... I'm not sure this is exactly answering the question, but the, you know, the, the way that I found into the idea of permanence and impermanence in the book um, was, it, it, I would have to think more about, I, I'm, the gears in my head are starting to turn around, you know, like present day movement, I mean, um, from place to place, but the, the way I was really engaging with it in the book, um, I think the, the realizations are really on the page in an essay called Centerless Universe, which is about um, the Fremont Bridge and was done during my residency in the Bridges Northwest Tower, the one with um, Rapunzel's hair um, in neon hanging out of the window. Um, anyway, you know, I was just thinking about how the place before settlement, you know, like the rivers flooded seasonally the land and the water like were very you know different from I don't know from moment to moment from season to season um but you know and then settlers arrived and for some reason decided they wanted this spot but they wanted it completely different <laughs> like fill in the tide flats you know um make the rivers so they don't flood anymore straighten the rivers so you can use them as shipping channels um you know, all attempts to make a permanent landscape that is, you know, relatively unchanging. And of course, you know, the regrading was, was part of the city's, you know, one of the city's major engineering pro projects um, related, but not, you know, an example of that phenomenon. But, um, you know, I was thinking about that um, requirement that the place, you know, in order to be a city, be um be fixed in place be you know be fixed in time be like you know mm -hmm. scrubbed of some of the you know essential marks of seasons and that you know got me thinking about permanence and my own obsession with permanence um mm -hmm. that seemed to be probably a 
um, an inheritance of settlement. Well, and now that Seattle has, a, it seems like it's a semi-permanent um, place in the national imagination as a place of radical rebellion, uh, and not only of great wealth and inequality, which is something that locals know very well, uh, but also uh, this, you know, this this lineage that goes back, you know, more than a hundred years, and yet crystallized in the Battle of Seattle in 1999. And Teresa, you know, in other worlds here, you called the battle in Seattle a significant parable for new anarchist politics and U.S. settler colonialism. And I wondered if you could talk about why and how it conveys that message. Yeah, I mean, I'm really interested in this, the story of the 1999 battle in Seattle and the way that it gets, you know, it's been retold in all these ways. Um, there's even a Charlize Theron movie about it. So you know that it's <laughs> a big deal. Um, and I'm, I first became interested in the story of the Battle of Seattle because when I was reading all of these texts about sort of the rise of, this is what David Graeber has called like new anarchism or like anarchism in the 21st century, that the almost all of the books had that story in it or some version of the story of the 1999 battle in Seattle. It was almost like a requisite part of talking about anarchism in this way. And so I became really, I was really interested in the book in just what is the work that stories do in maintaining social movements and especially in maintaining sort of the memory of social movements or the memories of things that, that, that go well, like how does it maintain the structure of social movements? How does it maintain the relationships? Um, and that story I think is so essential because it is, when I move, I mean, it's so meaningful here in Washington. Like when I teach about the, the battle in Seattle, students always have stories about it. Either their parents were there, or, you know, hmm. usually it's their parents were there, but <laughs> they like have some relationship to it. Um, I've had some students who were there and it's, there's always some sort of connection. And I think that with that story, I was interested in the work that it does in the world and especially in its retelling. And I was writing the book on the 20th anniversary of it. And so I was thinking about how is the story told? And I think one of the ways it was told that was really surprising to me when I moved here um, is that I learned about the 1856 Battle of Seattle, which was another battle during the Treaty War period here. And that, that wasn't really mentioned ever in the discussion of the 1999 Battle in Seattle. And so I was just interested in like, that as a sort of bigger, like the conversation about those two battles and their relationship in these stories. How did that show like maybe a bigger relationship between the way that history was being told in these narratives of the 1999 battle in Seattle? So I've said battle in Seattle a lot of times. <laughs> <laughs> Well, for our audience, in, in case they don't have, you know, a working uh, knowledge of the 1856 battle in Seattle, could you give a, a brief summary of, of what, you know, how it relates to uh, our discussion? Well, in, so in his book, Native Seattle, Cole Thrush calls it the sort of ur travail of Seattle. So it's this, it's this really important story about the sort of, um, it as a story operates as part of the history of settlement by being a story about an attack by native native invaders, which is like a really ironic way of presenting it, um, mm -hmm. where settlers had to defend themselves. And so it becomes this really important part of the sort of narrative of Seattle as this place that was like rightfully inhabited by settlers um, who were under attack by native people. And so, yeah, if that makes sense. Is that, is that a good background for it? Well, yeah, because certainly the, the perversion of that language, right? right? It shows that when you can control the narrative, you can control history and you can control the future and development and uh, trajectory of a place. Um, exactly. Yeah, and I went around to all the different monuments. There's all kinds of monuments mm -hmm. in Seattle to the battle in Seattle that are really interesting that I talk about in the book. Yeah. Uh, one of the things that you uh, mentioned is that uh, there has been an, a lot of claims by anarchists of kinship with native thought, right? And you're, you're made uneasy by those claims. And yet you also uh, see a possibility for kinship and networks of reciprocity. So I was wondering why do you, and how can those be established, do you believe? I think the thing that I, the thing that sort of makes me uneasy in general is when there's an assumed sort of relationship instead of an intentional relationship. And I think that that was something I was seeing and that there, because anarchism is really grounded in 
being anti-statist and being anti-capitalist, that it seemed like a lot of folks sort of assumed an easy relationship with Native communities who've also had this critique of the state um, and oftentimes of capitalism. And I think that to me, I, I was looking at ways that actually, what are some ways that anarchists and anarchism has become amenable with settlement, right? That so much of the, the discussion was about um, how, are, how is anarchist and native thought similar? And I was really interested in the question of how, are, how is anarchism and settlement similar? Because I didn't want that to be the case anymore. And I think that I, I think of it as really needing to establish a really intentional relationship between not just the fields, like in an academic sense, but between people and between movements. And to say, we need to be really intentional about confronting settlement because it's so insidious. And it's so, um, it's like really, settlement is very amenable to a lot of different sort of situations. And it, I think, remakes itself in really complex ways, um, even in radical spaces where it seems like it wouldn't fit. And so I was really interested in that relationship, but also as like you mentioned, Kristen, I write from like the we, and I write as a person in these movements who obviously still thinks that there's something worthwhile in there. And I think that that constant sort of assessment of what are we doing? Is it working? How is it working? What could we do better? Is an inherent part of anarchism that makes it like really a social movement and set of set of values that's able to build that kind of relationship, um, you know, against settlement, but it will take this really intentional thing. And I was worried that that wasn't happening. Well, I love the definition that you provided for anarchist hopes, which if I may paraphrase is a non-universal, non-hierarchical, non-coercive relationships of mutual aid dedicated to uh, deep ethics uh, with commitment to each other. And I, that, I'm like, well, who who doesn't want those things, right? <laughs> right? There's always this like- We know, hey, we us. know who. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we do know. Oh, we know. <laughs> um, but you know, this idea of having um, an uneasy relationship with one's own beliefs, even mm -hmm. with one's own life experiences is something I think that uh, unites both of you and your work because, and it's something that I really admire because if you get too comfortable, right, it drains us of rigor. And whenever we feel so firmly within an idea, it's when we're often right in the middle of standing squarely in the middle of our own bias. Um, and I really love, Alyssa, how you interrogate your own memory and your own understanding of the workings of your memory uh, in this book. And I was reading a, a really wonderful conversation that you uh, had with Sarah Nielsen, uh, who reviewed your book for the Seattle Times uh, in The Believer. And in that, you said that repetitions are foundational to your work and they're foundational in tribal storytelling and on Twitter and in incantations and in speech. And that repetition was not just a linguistic repetition, but you were also working throughout white magic with this idea of time loops and the recurrence of error and, uh, and habit and behavior and place. Um, so I was wondering, you know, you use these time loops both as uh, a narrative device uh, and as um, basically a, a structure of, for describing your life. And I wondered if you could talk about how you first recognized those patterns and then perhaps how you escaped from them uh, through the act of writing. You know, so my first my first book is um, similarly an essay collection. The essays are standalone for the most part, but they are it is meant to be read as a whole. It's meant to be a sort of book length narrative that just has you can think of them as chapters that are just very different in form. Um, either way, white magic is similar. So when I was after my body as a book of rules was mostly done. I did recognize that the way I saw it working structurally overall as a whole was that each essay goes through a sort of um, attempt and failure cycle and sort of gets back to, it's not quite a reset point. It's sort of like, you know, there's like an arc, but instead of, you know, ending up somewhere, it's just like a, you know, like a, just, it's just a loop back to where we started almost, but maybe an inch ad advanced. And just, I keep, you know, looping and inching and looping and inching toward, you know, 
And then it's like, oh, well, 60,000 words have passed and I haven't, you know, haven't figured anything out, but I've grown and changed maybe this much. Um, so, you know, I, 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 I knew that I liked that as, um, as a way for me to conceive of how a collection works that, you know, there has to be some kind of failure pattern happening throughout. Um, because if I succeed at the end of the first chapter, there's no book, we're done, no reason to be there. Um, so, you know, I wasn't really going into the writing of white magic with an idea of what it was going to be structurally as a whole, but once I started writing about the failed relationship that becomes a sort of like semi center of some of these essays, um, you know, I, I was writing about that relationship and then I needed to write about other relationships that had, um, not only failed in the past, but, you know, those relationships, you know, um, some of them were very bad and, um, and, you know, were abusive. And so as I was writing about all of these things, I mean, I knew that I had been choosing the wrong men for a long time. Like that's, you know, um, the, the idea of a pattern in relationships is like a cliche, which meant I wasn't really thinking about what that meant, you know, the book required that I think about it. Like if I put, if I'm putting something on the page, it's going to get unpacked. I'm going to know it far too well. So it has to be really intentional um, in writing essays for me. And so I was seeing what elements were causing that looping cycle. Where was I, where was I making the attempt? where was my, you know, rising action? Where was my falling action? Mm -hmm. Where, you know, where do I get into the gloom? Where do I reset back where I started? Um, so I, you know, I was, there's not like a kind of like one-to-one -one relationship between that and form, you know, but, but I think there is some kind of relationship between that and the forms that the book takes in considering time loops. Um, you know, I, I, other things that, you know, that are, that I was thinking about in, in repetition in this book are the ways that, um, that images are working as motifs, um, repeated images. I'm really fat. I was really just like, so drawn to the way James Welch used uh, symbols and, and motifs um, in Winter in the Blood, one of my favorite books, if not my favorite book. Um, I was so drawn to the, the use of extended metaphor. And when extended metaphor showed up in life, that became a set of synchronicities that is part of the magic that's, you know, in the title. Um, so those are some of the, you know, the, the repetition mechanisms happening in subject matter and in form. And I knew as I was nearing the end of the writing process that I wasn't going to, you know, I wasn't going to be able to finish the book without breaking these patterns. Um, I just knew it in my gut. I certainly don't believe that everything in life has to be resolved at the end of an essay collection, but I just had a gut feeling that I, I was not going to let myself get away with a partial resolution of these patterns. Like it had to stop. And there's this like hundred page essay where I just go through. Um, it's very hard to describe. There's a hundred page <laughs> essay that has overlapping timelines and does a lot of stuff with, with time and loops. And um, I think really trusting myself to be able to write something that was as ambitious as that essay. And, you know, as ambitious as this book which is long, which was very difficult to hold in my mind all at once. And, you know, I, I knew that if I could do that, if I could make meaning in that way and trust my gut enough to believe that it was going to come out and it was going to be what I wanted, then, you know, um, then I, I, I just had a feeling that I could, um, trusting myself like that was what I needed to break the cycles. And then, you know, it's too perfect. It happened. The, like, I, it really did, you know, I really did break out of those patterns, um, a couple years ago now. Um, and, and that's really what it took. Mm -hmm. 
Well, you've done it in that pattern breaking in multiple ways. Uh, I was very glad uh, to see you did this thing, the subversive uh, overlay of a three act structure onto it, uh, which I love. And you're speaking directly to the reader and about our expectations. But I was so delighted because I had been there on the day of the introduction to the third act and the sweetness and, um, and welcome there for uh, that rapturous release that you found from those patterns was something that I saw personally and it made me very happy. Um, but one of the things that I know that has made uh, many of your fans and readers uh, very uh, admiring and inspired is another pattern that you've broken, which is from uh, patterns of addiction and um, substance abuse. And so we have a question from the audience um, that says, Alyssa writes about her alcoholism and recovery. Congrats on that. How does she find that her creative process has changed in sobriety versus those years when she was writing in active addiction? Ooh, so yeah, I mean, I used to do a lot of things drunk. Um, I drank a lot. Uh, I drank often and I, I, I mean, I don't remember what it was like to do it. You know, I don't, there's, there's lots of things I don't remember because of that. What I, I believe, so after I got sober in 2015, I didn't write for a while. I wrote one essay, maybe like late summer um, that year, and then started writing a little bit toward the end of the year. But, you know, it was really slow for a long time. And I wasn't sure I, I, I didn't know if I was ever going to really write again. I was, I just, you know, I, I was just so now I can see, and I think I could see then it took so much energy just to get well and to remake my thinking um, and to learn how to live with pain. Like, and that's a big thing that this book is about that I was I mean, so many incredibly painful things happened to me, just like so many, like terrible, terrible things happened to me. And um, it's pretty hard to just, you know, have to face that all the time. Um, and it took a lot of energy to try to, you know, learn how to like have that life and that mind that was able to handle it. That was a lot of work. I think I knew it at the time and I did really try to give myself a lot of grace and just work on getting well. Um, I was also getting off of psych meds at that time because as I write in the book, um, we, I mean, I learned that I wasn't really bipolar. Um, I'd been misdiagnosed. So lots of things were happening in the mind of Alyssa Washuda in 2015. And then, you know, what eventually happened once I started, you know, slowly writing again and then quickly started writing again, like being sober 100% of the time for a long time has, you know, I, I have a very bad memory still, but I'm able to hold like large projects and large ideas in my head in a way I could never before. Yeah. I, I can see now how, how small my scope was. Um, white magic absolutely would not have happened with, you know, if I were still drinking, um, not just because it's at the heart of the book, but because it is a, like a large project that required that I hold like this whole, you know, this, this whole galaxy in my head at once of all of the things that I needed it to be about. And so, you know, I'm, I'm really used to being sober now. Um, and it's just, you know, I, I think that, um, it's very hard for me to just kind of like compare them because I don't totally remember what it was like, because I'm, I think I'm just a really, really different person now. And that means I'm a very different writer. Well, if I may, having known you in both periods, I would say you have become perhaps as kind to yourself as you were to others. You were always kind. But maybe you mentioned in the book how you've relinquished some of the self-hatred that perhaps the substances were sustaining. And um, that kindness now has pivoted around um, and shown its light on your work, mm -hmm. which I'm grateful for. 
And, you know, living with pain is one of those things that, you know, giving a name to something provides mindfulness, which provides distance, which provides a possibility for mastery. And yet it can also be painful to name something. And so, Teresa, I was wondering, you know, you give a name to something which I had never heard of before and yet made so much sense to me. And it was uh, this term of settler anarchism. Mm. And I wondered if you could talk a bit about that, because, of course, my understanding um, of anarchy has been misshapen in so many ways by uh, its representation in contemporary thought as uh, a white male, you know, uh, violence, right? And remembering uh, through the historical record that uh, anarchy uh, was founded through, you know, immigrant communities of color um, and brought into uh, our thinking through that. Um, and yet maybe some of the contemporary ideas are not really reckoning with uh, the fact that every immigrant that comes to this country does become a settler. So this term uh, was really compelling for me. And I wondered if you could talk to the audience about settler anarchy. Yeah, um, well, I want to, you know, I think it's, it makes sense that the connection that you're making to Alyssa's work too about naming things that are difficult to name, but doing that publicly and doing that as part of the process. And I was thinking today when I was thinking about this event of like how Alyssa does this great thing in White Magic about sort of naming craft and naming something in public, like as she's doing it, as she's talking about the rising action or the falling action, like talking about I'm, I don't know why I'm saying her, Alyssa, you, <laughs> you do this thing. And I, you know, I think I was trying to name something very uncomfortable also publicly and to say, you know, I think we need to come up with a term to talk about this. I was really interested. I'm glad you brought up this, the sort of legacy of anarchism in America as being connected to immigrant communities. Cause I was trying to think of this. The question I think I was interested in is how have we dealt with, as anarchists, how have we dealt with the question of doing anarchism in this place, in this place in particular, in the United States, in a settler colony? Like how, how might anarchism change as it moves? And how have we sort of, how have we, or how have we not reckoned with that as anarchists? And I, you know, the term settler anarchism gave me a way of thinking about I was, it, I was actually inspired by this article. I wish I could remember the title now, um, but it was about Proudhon and about the anarcho-sexism in Proudhon. So about the way that sexism became sort of expressed in anarchist terms in his work. And so I was inspired by that to think about, well, what are, instead of thinking about one of the popular terms um, to think about the relationship between anarchist and indigenous thought is anarcha indigenism and i was thinking you know okay but what's the relationship between settlement and anarchism what just what is that especially since we live in this place and we need to reckon with where we are the term became a way of naming this um, form of anarchism that hasn't really reckoned with that question at all um, or not maybe not at all but not well enough to sort of make me call it something else <laughs> and it was a it was a really uncomfortable thing to name um, and i'm so glad that you brought it up that way cuz it's it's something that I've been thinking about a lot with the book about how it will be received and what, you know, I wanted to write something that was critical mind, critically minded in thinking about, which I think connects to Alyssa, what you're doing too. Like I wanted to do something that was in, interrogative, like that was really thinking critically about the things that, that I was looking at without it being just like a straight up denouncement or something like that. Cause I'm, I'm writing from that space. I'm writing f as a person who's been in these movements for, for a decade or more and thinking about, I wanna continue being in these movements and what will it take for me to feel good about that given what I've learned and given what I know. And so I think that, I, that, that term for me brings up that possibility, um, which I think I just see a lot of connections between Alyssa's work in mind in that sense of trying to name things that are, um, that you have to, to sort of live right with the world. And as you note yeah. in your essays, you know, it's evolving, right? Even the yeah. anarcho indigenous, you know, indigenism and then, you know, replacing that, that center O with a, an arroba symbol, you know, yeah. to gesture sort of the Latino Latina idea of breaking down those gender binaries uh, was so fascinating to me. 
And terms, you know, like practices are useful as prisms, right? And they can bend the light in a new way for us to understand uh, the world. But sometimes, you know, uh, we come to discard them or move past them. And so one of the things I want to talk to you about, Alyssa, was that you talk in this book a lot about, you use the structures of tarot and the structures uh, and symbolism of tarot and of astrology uh, beautifully. Uh, the conjunctions within the essays are so beautiful, the rising and the falling and the intersections and the near misses and the gravitational pull between these people is planetary. Um, and yet when you told uh, Naimon uh, on the Between the Covers podcast, that you, know, you had used tarot and astrology to hone your intuition, but that you had found that the best way to channel your energies was writing. Um, and so I wondered, um, are you a witch? And do you consider these essays to be witchcraft? Um, I mean, I think yes, yes. I'm, it's complicated. So, you know, I think that, um, like, I think, I think I'm a witch. I don't do spells anymore. I'm not that into tarot. I stopped really, um, doing astrology because, um, the astrology of 2020 was like very bad and people knew about this for years beforehand and were, you know, uh, bringing messages of doom. <laughs> I just couldn't handle it. I, I had to get out of there. And I realized that, you know, I mean, all of those practices for me, I could see that I could not let go of my sense of control, that I was trying to use them to make things happen that I wanted to happen. And of course I would, you know, add my little disclaimer to what, whenever I like wrote down my intention or something that like, this is what I want or something better for all involved. But I mean, I was still trying to control things by using these tools and practices and avenues. And through writing, I mean, I had been doing it so much longer and just had so much of my, it was so my own that, um, that I was able to actually get to a place with a, like a spiritual place where I had been trying to get with all those other practices, which is really like tapping into some power I didn't understand. Um, and it's, it's sort of like, it's kind of like, I, I mean, it's hard to explain. It's probably easier to just see in my book, White Magic. Um, but, you know, there's, there are all these synchronicities of research that started happening. Um, you know, first there were synchronicities in life uh, with weird ways that Twin Peaks was showing up in my, like, you know, day-to-day -day experience um, in, you know, in the, in my physical reality. But in my, in my research, I just kept finding these things that were really um, incredible connections that felt absolutely unexplainable. And that still happens all the time. You know, I'm not, like I said, I'm not doing, um, I'm not doing any of the things that I was doing before to try to, you know, speak to the universe. Mm -hmm. I, it, it didn't, it didn't become necessary anymore because I felt when I was writing and when all of these things were coming together so perfectly, I was hearing what I always wanted to hear when I was a child. And I was like praying and just wondering, when am I going to get an answer from God? It came through research, you know, it came through the same thing showing up over and over in all these different areas. Like, you know, the same, like, the, the magician who had the same name as the ex-boyfriend that I was writing about when I was already writing about magicians, like just things that seemed unexplainable that still happens, even though I'm not trying, I've like, you know, I've turned that on and it's, I have it now. And so it feels like I, I actually am like ha hardwired into this power I was always reaching for. It's such a fascinating notion that prior, you were looking at this landscape, right? Almost of the future, almost in the way of a settler. You wanted to control and shape and reduce the, the transformations that were occurring outside of your control. So it sounds yep. to me like the process of writing helped you decolonize your mind, that you yeah. actually did it, which is a very hard thing and a continual unfolding process, right? Yeah. Uh, but that's yeah, fascinating so. to me. 
And, you know, the idea that you, um, by stopping trying to control, uh, became more open to the transformations that were already happening um, is a beautiful legacy um, of this book and something I highly recommend to readers. Um, we have time for one more question from the audience. And so I want to uh, take this question. I think it's so beautiful because it allows us to do what I feel like women do best, um, which is to build the canon uh, in an inclusive way. And so this question um, is, are there any contemporary books or authors who have influenced y'all a great deal? Your discussion is reminding me of Braiding Sweetgrass by Robin Wall Kimmerer. Um, so I'll, I'll kick it to you, Teresa, first, and then uh, to you, Alyssa, to wrap up. Oh, this question always gets me because I just think of the last thing that I read <laughs> instead of like really- Still building that canon. I know, still building that canon. Um, I, I think a book that I recommend to folks a lot that really transformed my thinking was um, Split Tooth by Tanya Tagak, which yes. really taught me so much about when I was thinking in, in writing the book about the possibilities of literature and the connections to other forms of building worlds, like just other forms of world building, um, that that book did did so much. And when I listen, and then I, I read it and then I listened to the audiobook, and it was the first time that I really understood the different dimensions. I think that a book could have in that way. Um, and so that's a big, that was big and influential for me. Um, I'm trying to think of a good, I mean, David Graeber's work has been really uh, essential to me to understand 21st century anarchism as a movement and not in the sort of like intra anarchist fighting that is sometimes <laughs> what is in the milieu, but thinking about like its impact and its like joyous side. Um, I think he writes a lot. He has a great article about puppets in the 1999 protest. And I think I want so much to be thinking about the, the pieces of joy in social movements because that's what's gonna, I think, move them forward. And so I would say his work has been really influential on that side. And Alyssa Washuda's new book, White Magic, has been, I mean, when I read it, I, I just was thinking so much about, I just wanna write about it now and talk to Alyssa. I wrote about her first book in Other Worlds Here. And um, yeah, Alyssa has always been very influential to me as a person. And likewise, and I, I also actually want to talk about Split Tooth um, because that book was so useful in my teaching. Um, I think it's really, it's, it's such a beautiful way into the process of um, being able to feel deeply in response to a text without necessarily understanding it. Um, and not being, you know, like it, there's just such a, a felt reaction to that book from, for, for all of the readers that I worked with in my class. And certainly for me, um, I reached for a couple books because I know Teresa and I both, uh, love both of these writers who I saw on the screen yesterday, but Hyde Erdrich, um, I haven't read this book or the one I'm going to show up the other one I'm going to show yet, but I mean, Hyde is just incredible yeah. um, and has just done so much amazing work over her career. Um, this is a be beautiful poetry collection um, that is her most recent. And um, Leanne Batassima Sack Simpson, again, I haven't read this one, but her book, As We Have Always Done, was, I mean, maybe the most life-changing book I've ever read. Um, probably that and Th This Wound is a World by Billy Ray Belcourt both um, really profoundly changed me. Um, and and I, I wrote about, um, as we have always done in, in White Magic, um, it just is, you know, the, the concepts that, the most important concept I'll speak to from that book for me personally that really changed me was the idea of seeing one another's light. And, you know, and I think that like that, um, I mean, speaking, you know, thinking about, I was thinking about this also after I answered the question about sobriety, being sober helps me to see other people's light and to mm -hmm. see, you know, my light reflected back from them. Um, and I think that that's, that's a, like a beautiful feature of her work. And that's a beautiful feature of my friendships with both of you. And, um, 
you know, and I think that's something that uh, our writing has has been able to do for us both to Teresa and me. Yeah. Yeah, Alyssa and I see each other very well. Mm -hmm. <laughs> These books, your books, both of them are veritable troves of uh, intellectual references, emotional depths and historical breadth. So really, I highly recommend to our audience as our town hall hosts uh, come back up on the screen that they check out your work uh, as a conduit to a constellation of beautiful thinkers. So thank you both so much for your conversation tonight. It's beautiful. Thank you, friends. Thank you. Yeah, and on behalf of Town Hall, I want to thank you all as well. Um, as you were talking, I was just kind of thinking that, um, you know, it's we have a lot of events, but it's not every event that we're um, sort of invited to really dig in and explore the depths of like, our understanding of ourselves and our surroundings through our speakers experiences so it's like very uh it's i just really thank you so much for your insight it's been really pleasurable to, to listen to you all speak um i want to thank the audience for watching as well um thank you for your questions there's a couple of links in the chat there to pick up these two awesome books uh one is through the press and one is actually through third place so they're going to take you to different sites but um but please uh, purchase through those links and we can um, support uh, third place tonight. Um, and, you know, I, I hope that in the future we can invite all, all of you to the building. Uh, we're hoping for that to be open sometime sooner than later. But um, until then, I hope that you all stay safe uh, and have a great night.